Hello, School Transportation Nation. It's a special episode of the Nation's Podcast, our 200th episode. We're so glad you're here with us. And our podcast is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software, Propane, the energy for everyone, and First Student, the largest provider of student transportation in North America. A little later, we'll be talking with Wayne Lee, keynote speaker, entertainer for STN Expo Indianapolis. That's going to be May 31st through June 4th out there in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, we are putting together a jam-packed agenda of educational classes, training around leadership, green energy, technology. It's a must attend, guys. If you are available, come out, be part of STN Expo. We also have STN Expo Reno as well. Can't forget about that. That is uh, this summer as well, out in July. It's going to be July 12th through the 17th. So we are looking forward to seeing you guys out there. stnexpo.com for all the details. And uh, Ryan Gray is going to be talking with Paul Hassenmeyer, Public Safety Director and Fire Chief for Hernando County in Florida. And not to mention, Mr. Ryan Gray is with us as well. Ryan, welcome. Hello, Tony. How's it going? Happy 200th episode, man. This is exciting. Happy 200th. You know, I was looking uh, at, uh, you know, March 23rd, 2020 is when we came out with episode number one. So I was going back to the headlines and just looking, you know, what were we talking about way back then? I don't know if you remember, Tony, but, you know, coronavirus, COVID-19. I I was looking at the New York Times. They had their their summary of all their, their headlines. And except for like, you know, the Walking Dead, you know, there's a, a review on The Walking Dead um, a TV show. But I mean, of course, it was just, you know, COVID-19, coronavirus, COVID-19, pandemic, all the way down the line, economy, health, you know, school, just, you know, it's crazy how far we've come over the last you know, four years. Yeah, no, all, our headlines were also like ST and Expo goes virtual, right? We mm-hmm. do the uh, virtual conference. We did our bus technology summit. Virtual was our first installment of the uh, of the virtual conference experience, which was a learning experience. It was a steep curve. We uh, we figured it out, and the technology was moving at, uh, at a blistering pace to see uh, how we could make it and bring our community together. And uh, and full circle now, bringing bus technology summit to ST and Expo Indianapolis for. The the light version with the labs and then rolling it into STN Expo in Charlotte in uh, March of 2025. So that'll be really exciting. So yeah, lot, lots happening, Ryan. I appreciate bringing that forward. Uh, also new, we've got our brand new March edition. Guys, if you haven't seen it yet, make sure and go to stnonline.com. Check out that right column of the homepage. The magazine's right there. Or go under the magazine tab to check out the March issue. Any, any highlights, Ryan? Any top stories? you want to hit on that you recommend for people to go read first? Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to read them all, Tony. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, we, we're looking at routing, uh, you know, still a lot of folks dealing with the driver shortage and, and turning to uh, software as well as, you know, there's a lot, a lot of folks out there that still do hand routing um, and, and how that uh, impacts things and all the variables that they have to deal with. And it's, you know, uh, we're going to have a great session on that actually in Reno in July. Um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, calling it routing 101. It's not a, a, a full day. I mean, you could have a full week uh, on, on how, to, how to route, uh, but really looking at the fundamentals of it, uh, taking the technology out of it while, you know, technology certainly plays a big role, um, you know, just really looking at those variables and, and how to effectively route uh, to begin with, because you really have to understand that uh, you, the technology just can't do it for you. Uh, you have to have some good fundamentals at play. Um, so there's that article. I know, you know, Taylor wrote that article for us. Uh, uh, then we have, you know, looking at artificial intelligence, uh, no surprise there, uh, you know, looking at how that's evolving and looking at, you know, whether that's in, in you know, you being used in the, in the shop or on the road, uh, looking at RFPs, uh, that process, you know, that, that's a, a, an issue in and of itself. And, and actually another session we're going to be having in Reno, we're going to be talking about effective RFPs and getting a panel together of some experts, uh, both at the school districts and um, from the vendor standpoint to, you know, how do we develop those to, with, with success in mind for 
all parties. We're looking at comparing fuel efficiency in the March issue, We're looking at electric and, and some of the, the early data coming out that's showing some gains uh, when compared to diesel and, and propane, uh, as well as we talk about CNG, uh, and uh, also fast-growing school districts. So how those school districts are getting impacted and what they're doing to stay ahead of the curve in terms of transportation. Nice. I know in my article, I hit on the uh, Tesla story as well in terms of uh, the autopilot and uh, the cars driving by not recognizing a school bus in terms of the software, which uh, we've talked a little bit about that. We have a story on our website about it as well that you wrote. And so very interesting stuff there too. So guys, definitely worth a read. Pick up that March edition of School Transportation News. Go on the website if you can't wait for your print copy in the mail and uh, catch up on the latest and greatest. All right, before we get some more headlines, we take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. This week's green tip is brought to you by propane, the energy for everyone. Did you know that school buses fueled by propane can help you reduce emissions in your community while saving you money? Propane school buses have a lower average carbon intensity than electric school buses over their lifetime by more than half. And they emit up to 96% less nitrogen oxide than diesel buses. All this from fleets with the lowest total cost of ownership. It's no wonder propane is the most widely used alternative fuel for school buses. Learn more at betterourbuses.com. That's betterourbuses.com. All right, we're back, Ryan. Other top headlines. We saw Lion Electric come out with fourth quarter fiscal results as well as 2023 results. So what what did they say? What did the uh, results say from the earnings? Well, uh, on the good uh, side of things, a 29% uh, increase in uh, Q4 uh, revenue compared to, to last year. You know, there was about uh, 188 vehicles. Uh, didn't break it down with school buses, um, but uh, a dozen or so more vehicles uh, compared to the quarter uh, previous. Um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, fiscal uh, 23 highlights, uh, revenue up about 113.6 million uh, to 253.5 million. Uh, but you know, they are um, indicating some, some gross losses um, as well, but not as bad as 2022. And I think that you know, it, it reflects on one hand the impact that the EPA Clean School Bus Program is making obviously flushing the industry with cash to purchase these electric school buses. We've seen it across all of the EV manufacturers. Essentially, they're all um, announcing you know um, increased revenue. But you know, of course, you know, and Lion has its new Joliet uh, facility. Um, a couple of other manufacturers have have opened new facilities recently. So, of course, uh, there is some uh, some some losses with that, just from a standpoint of of operating and in, in, in um, new construction costs and whatnot. Um, but you know, it's it's going to be interesting. You and I were talking about it earlier. Because so much of the electric market is being propped up by the federal dollars and state funding programs as well. Uh, we've been talking about it for a while, even for, for what we do, what we cover in the industry. How is, as we start to see the EPA program sunset in the next few years, I think there, it's supposed to be um, all wrapped up. You know, At least the last funding is going to be in 2026. We'll still see buses being delivered as we kind of bleed into the, the late 2020s. Uh, but then what? Um, I don't think that there's really going to be any appetite, uh, especially looking at the, the 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 federal debt and the deficit that we're running and, and just how Congress can be a, such a quagmire. Then we're going to see any more federal funding, to, especially at this level uh, for electric or green school buses. Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, the manufacturers are singing a relatively – upbeat tune right now in, in terms of, of their revenue and their production. Uh, but as we look at also some state uh, laws that are going to be coming into effect, local uh, mandates uh, for electric vehicles, 
you know what what's that's going to look like uh, in in terms of production. Uh, we're hearing you know the OEMs are all talking you know giving us these these uh, pictures of being able to produce tens of thousands of electric school buses a year. You know that remains to be seen. And with some of these state laws, I mean, I know in New York, there's been a lot of pushback on, on their law. 2027 is when school districts need to to start purchasing electric school buses. There's um, some aspects of that where they can they can get some um, some postponements. But you know, we're we're there, there's a there's an effort afoot there to really push back on that law that by 2035, fleets have to be 100 percent electric. So you know, it, it's. Uh, uh, positive in, in terms of seeing more electric school buses manufactured, but it's ultimately going to come down to the sustainability of them. Yeah, I know I sent you a story I had seen, uh, a finance story where Mercedes Benz had talked about walking back the thought of only making electric cars by 20. 20- 30. Mm-hmm. Now, they now have said, no, they're going to enhance uh, the existing technology that they have in terms of the gasoline and diesel powered platforms uh, and really lean into that. So they've walked back that thought that that is going to mm-hmm. be the only uh only horse in the uh, in the barn. So uh, it sounds like they're going to offer a diversified choice for customers. And one could surmise that you're going to see other OEMs follow suit. And we've seen some of the bigger OEMs, Ford and a few other ones, really lose their shirt on EV. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've got other guys like Tesla, you know, where they're making bigger strides. And you've got a lot of other smaller upstart uh, EV consumer car companies that are out there making moves as well. So, you know, it has some similarities to the commercial space in some aspects and not in others. Um, We'll see how government funding drives the future of school transportation. Obviously, being in a presidential election cycle, uh, a lot of that is probably going to be predicated on on that outcome uh, in terms of federal support. Maybe state support will continue in the states that have been strong supporters like New York and California, but uh, we'll see what it looks like like for the future of the market. But mm-hmm. like you said, there is kind of an undertone of negative sentiment about EV and, you know, how much of that is going to carry through. I um, mean, you know, I, I, I'm more concerned. I don't want it to give the school bus industry uh, a negative look, a negative, uh, a black eye, right? Because not necessarily is it the industry's fault by any no. stretch, right? It's such a new technology. Everybody's trying to get in lockstep with all these partners uh, to make it work. And you're only as strong as your weakest link. And and this also becomes a big utility question, which is really raged as a big factor is, is that they are going to move at the speed they feel comfortable with. And it's not at the speed that everybody else wants which is faster so absolutely this this is the plight we're in man i've been talking about it for a while now and i've been you know when all the we were seeing all the pr out there about whether it be electric school buses or electric vehicles and i you know i feel like for a good year or maybe longer i've been saying well god I, i hope that you know these these headlines don't turn and and give that especially from a school bus angle give that a black eye because it's not the school district's fault they're being in a lot of ways forced to deploy these vehicles, but it's very complicated. And that's what everyone, everybody, you know, has found that out. And it's, it's not a secret anymore. And even when, you know, you're looking at Tesla and their sales are down. I mean, you know, California has a 10% uh, sales decline in the fourth quarter. Um, That was a, you know, just this last month and in January, talking about the Tesla sales slowdown. Some of that's tied to their their pricing as well but that's also that pricing is is responsive or reflective of the market right now and just you know a lot of owners they've gotten past kind of that early adopter and a, a lot of you know higher income folks of course are, are going to be the first ones with the more disposable income to to latch on to some of this new technology the the cool toys if you will but now we're really getting into the realm of how practical is this? And, you know, I shared with you an article um, recently, I think it was from Car and Driver, where uh, uh, a journalist, uh, you know, they they get, the, the staff gets some of these electric vehicles and they had the the new um, Ford F-150 Lightning and talking about a spur of the moment 
trip that he and his wife had to take for a family emergency driving from California up to Oregon and how um, complicated it was to do that trip and, and find charging stations that they could use and they get to the charging stations that the system tells them to go to and then they find out they're down. Uh, you know, it's just – um, it's a little bit of a different experience from school buses, but it's the same concept there where, you know, from a, especially look from a routing standpoint, we know that so many school districts just cannot use electric school buses on their longer routes. Uh, they have to keep them, you know, th- those in city or those, those shorter routes. So there is a lot of implications to this and w- we're starting to see, you know, more and more headlines that are really Getting beyond the the PR of this is clean for the environment, these are great, um, and here's all this money for them to okay, what does this actually mean to the owner? Um, and you know, a lot still to be figured out. Um, a lot of money invested in it, um, and we've talked about the OEMs in the in the school bus market, um, and we have comp- companies like Cummins that have made huge investments, uh, but then we look at a company like Mercedes Benz that's been making a huge investment, and that that's a Daimler company, so it's a relative of Thomas uh, built school buses. That they're saying, hold on, you know, we're we're recalibrating, and it just those kind of things when you see those afoot, it does give you pause and wonder, okay, what's going to happen in the school bus side? Now I know we were talking about a new federal program to help. So you want to dive into that? Our friends at uh, NREL and the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. So what's new from them, Ryan? Yeah. So it always comes down to um, infrastructure, right? And you know, there's all, all of the OEMs essentially, um, almost to a T, have some kind of consulting. Um, program that they've rolled out over the last couple of years to assist customers with all the intricacies, all those complications that, that I mentioned earlier with construction uh, of their of their yards to get the necessary power in, you know, behind the meter, working with the utilities. Uh, procurement, how to route analysis. I mean, the list goes on and on. Last month, on February 20th, NREL and the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation announced their Clean Bus Planning Award. So this is a $5 million program, essentially. Uh, It's open now. Um, There was really no time limit put on it, but $5 million probably won't last a, a super long time. But the Fed's now jumping in, Department of Energy backed, saying, uh, hey, we we realize um, the the need that school districts have, um, and and you know um, also eligible tribal governments, uh, private contractors, uh, national associations that are nonprofit. So think of like you know NAPT, NSTA, um, as well as states and other governmental uh, organizations that that run school buses. They're eligible not for money per se but for technical assistance from electrification experts. So this program is looking to, you know, reduce the the burden on fleet managers, coordinate uh, internal and external project teams, you know, establish realistic short-term and long-term targets and provide that technical analysis so that these deployments are successful. And there's an element of this talking about deployments that after the fact they can, the, these uh, um, applicants, that the, these winning applicants can receive assistance with actual school bus deployment. But really this first phase is targeted toward the the, the planning of it. Um, so, you know, looking to, to p- perhaps have some more information on this uh, this summer at our conferences. Stay tuned. Uh, but you we do have an article up on stnonline.com where you can read more about it and get links so you can get into those, into the details of this program and find out how to apply. Excellent. Thanks for that update, Ryan. All right. Before we kick things in with our interviews, we have a message from our sponsor. This message is brought to you by First Student, the largest provider of student transportation in North America. Transforming the school bus into an extension of the classroom, First Student's program first serves, redefines the student experience and behavior by seamlessly implementing proven classroom interventions on the bus. This innovative program ensures a cohesive support system tailored to each student's needs with advanced driver training and research based interventions. 
First Serves paves the way for a safer, more supportive journey for every student. Visit firststudentinc.com slash first serves to learn more today. That's firststudentinc.com slash first serves. Okay, we are now joined on the School Transportation Nation podcast by the incredible, the talented, the tantalizing Wayne Lee. Wayne, thanks for joining us. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Ryan. It's an absolute pleasure. So uh, I, I uh, let in with that introduction because as some of you out there in the nation know, Wayne Lee will be with us in Indianapolis when we have our STN Expo, May 31st through June 4th. And Wayne is this year's keynote speaker as well as the trainer during our Transportation Director Summit. Uh, so Wayne, you know, you and I have talked a little bit uh, previously. We have an article up on you on our event news on stnonline.com. Uh, really, your, um, your, your program is based on peak performance, and you rely on hypnotism to uh, affect that. Uh, so we had a great talk about um, hypnotists and, and uh, peak performance uh, about a month ago or so. Um, first of all, Tell our audience a little bit about, you know, because we when we think of hypnotists, we think of like, oh, bark like a dog and, you know, make people do silly things. And I think there's there's going to be some of that um, in your act. But in terms of really recalibrating our mindset, tell us a little bit about that and how you got into um, this line of work. Yeah, for sure, right? Like, first of all, it's fascinating. The, the subject of Hypnosis is fascinating, as well as, like you said, fearful for many. So it's a really great opportunity for me to start that conversation by saying, I had no idea that I would be a hypnotist, that I'd be doing this later on in my life. What really turned it around for me was, as I was becoming a school teacher, I was watching a hypnosis show in a nightclub, and I was absolutely blown away. My mind was blown watching these people do all these outrageous things on stage, like many people may have that are listening may have seen uh, a show. And I question, I'm like, is this even real? And it wasn't until that I looked over my girlfriend at the time, um, watching the same show, she's doing exactly what the people are up, up on stage are doing. So she got hypnotized in the audience. And that validated that there's something really powerful going on and I really wanted to find out what that was. Coupled with the fact that um, I came from a, a, an athletic background in, in amateur wrestling where I did a lot of visualization, a lot of guided imagery, and I put two and two together and I realized there's a parallel here. You know, what people say to themselves on an ongoing basis, what they see in their mind's eye, really and ultimately affects their performance. In fact, the, you know, whether they're propelling themselves forward or paralyzing themselves. And so that was the start of an adventure that's a labor of love in regards to people that can change the thoughts that they're thinking. They can overcome their self-limiting beliefs to perform at a higher level. Whether they see a show where there's somebody's dancing because they're hypnotized, it's no different. What if somebody was giving themselves a suggestion to perform at a higher level, to be a better leader, to achieve their their goals personally and professionally so that parallel is is um, really allowed me to look at life as one big hypnosis show people either performing or they're not they're winning or losing and so how can you hypnotize yourself to win more in life yeah and i think you know um uh, from my standpoint, having, you know, been involved, uh, and I think I shared with you when I was in, I remember my grad night way back when, uh, in high, from high school and we had a hypnotist and I participated in it and it was, it's like the power of suggestion. And like, as I remember what was going on and it was fun and, but it, it wasn't the experience that I thought it was going to be because you watch the movies or TV yeah. shows and these people get hypnotized and they, you know, you snap your fingers and they come to and they're like, oh, where am I? What? And they, it's like they're, they've been in this, uh, this black hole, right? And they've come out of it and they don't remember what they did. Um, and I've seen some people react that way. And I think that that's just kind of, you know, maybe how they play into it. 
Um, but my personal experience was I knew what was going on, but it was just, I was at ease. I was having fun and I was going with the flow. Yes. And I think that in our daily lives, there's so many stressors. Uh, there's so many, you know, things uh, vying for our attention. There's a lot of trauma that a lot of people deal with, a lot of stress. Uh, and, it, you know, you, we talk about that intuition or that gut. And unfortunately, and I speak from experience, we don't always listen to that gut that that intuition that 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 gut telling us hey you know we need to do this or we shouldn't be doing that from my standpoint i think of it as you know the 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 hypnosis is stripping away all of that excess baggage and just letting us be in the moment and identify what we want to do and start like you said you know putting ourselves in the in the proper mindset to to go out and get it uh, that, you know what you said it perfectly right like in regards to when people are hypnotized, first of all, just to clarify and validate what you just said, is that I had that same experience when I got into this, you know, 30 some years ago, I went on stage expecting to sleep, not know what was happening in a state of hypnosis. And it's actually the reverse. It's actually you're at a heightened state of awareness. And one of the things that I say on stage is that you're aware, you just don't care. Mm -hmm. So you've released the one thing that stops people from performing at a higher level. That one thing is fear and doubt. And so when people have that fear and doubt, that's that's their guidance telling them that they're not aligned. They're not in the flow. Like you said, that flow. And I like to say flow is an acronym for feeling life operate within your true authentic self. And when that happens, you're you're tuned in. You're in the present moment. And it's beyond circumstances because we know that there are people that have gone through incredibly tough circumstances. Some people can handle it really well. They can be in the flow and they can say, bring it on. I can handle it. And other people, they completely shut down. What's the difference? Are they hardwired differently? No, I think it has to do with one thing. It has to do with the subconscious programs that are running that are usually picked up when they're a kid. And that's the hypnosis that they are, they're living through right now. Okay. So, you know, a lot of times people look, it looks like I'm putting people to sleep on stage. And I, I like to say that I'm helping people wake up to their mm -hmm. true authentic power and, and live at a higher level of performance and joy, freedom and love. So uh, they, they can create more of what they want in life. So relaxation obviously has a, a big role to play in that. Hence the, the perception that people are falling asleep or yeah. you know, putting, being put into some coma or some trance, yeah. um, which I want to get back to that word in a second, because I think it's important with what you're doing, what, what you do. For sure. For but, sure. In terms of like becoming a hypnotist, is there a hypnotist school? What? How did you take? Okay, you went to this this nightclub show in the nineties yeah. with your girlfriend at the time, and then you decided, hey, this is what I want to do. Was it the next morning, that day, that like in the moment, or was it like did it this take a couple of weeks, months, and then again, do you go to yeah. like hypnotist university? Like, how do you? How do you become a hypnotist? Well, I think that, you know, to answer that question, I think it was that when I had seen that show that night, I was so blown away. I just had this profound curiosity. I was hungry to know what that was all about. And a part of me was like, yeah, I want to do that. I had a background in doing some acting and some, uh, I, I love to entertain people. I, I did some magic. So I think I had all of that already there in that perfect timing to set me there on stage to look at that show and go, wow. And so it was just a natural pro progression and it found me and then it just started to build and build and build. And when I was doing this back uh, years ago, there, there was no internet per se to, to, to find out how this all worked. So I went to the library, I researched, I, I read all the books, I watched videos, and then I started to do one thing that I think is critical in learning how to become very successful at something is finding mentors and people that are experts. And so I searched out everywhere. And I think I had a belief that was, you know, I can do this. There's a way to do this. And that was watching people, studying them. Uh, they were very gracious and giving me their time and their energy and telling me which way to go. And I was self-taught. I learned how to do it. And then when I hypnotized a few people, the first volunteers that I hypnotized it was the turning point. It was like, this really works wow, anyone can do this. You just have to learn how to do it. And then I, and then that opened the door for me to take courses, to learn more. And I've always been a student now. I've never come to this conclusion that I know how to do all of this. It's always about improving. It's always about learning the craft 
And so anyone can do this. They can take courses online. They can do courses through specific uh, certification programs. And But my, my journey was that. I learned on my own. I, I had some great guidance and mentors. And then I just kept going and had a lot of stage time because when I transitioned from teaching to doing this, which took a year, I was out there doing it all the time and I was messing up. I was, you know, practicing. And I think that's another big uh, underlying belief that allows people to succeed in life is failing forward fast, you know, Mm -hmm. getting out there and, and, and being okay with messing up. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's tons of literature out there about uh, failing to succeed. Mm-hmm. You've got to fail first to, to actually succeed. And there's there's a lot of case studies out there, highly uh, accomplished people that have failed over and over again until they finally found that secret sauce. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, so so tell our audience, you know, uh, what kind of organization, what kind of groups have you hypnotized? Yeah. And. Were there any instances, uh, success stories that you learned later on and maybe you you worked with a group or an individual? We won't name names. You know, yeah. We can name the organizations if, you, if you'd like. Um, but then you checked in with them later and you know they set out on a goal and they achieved it. Yeah. No, that's a great question, right? And just to kind of give people uh, an overview or a bit of a big picture, I think I've worked with over 7,500 people different groups. Like I have given, like in the 30 years I've done this, 7,500 presentations. So sometimes it's hard to go, okay, what are, what are all the groups? Cause there's a ton of them. And I've, you know, been blessed to be able to help entertain and empower people. Uh, just recently, I just know on LinkedIn, somebody commented um, and she was uh, an HR professional and uh, she was within a ca- uh, in the accounting focused area. And I posted a, a little bit of a clip of where I was going to be. And she goes, Wayne, I was at your event 20 years ago. It was 20 or 15 years ago. I forget exactly the time period. And she says, Wayne, I'll never forget on your stage, you did this exercise at the end where you had us think of a goal and feel as though we've achieved it. And then link that to a color as well as a word. She said, 10 years, almost to the day I, I achieved that goal. And she said, it just wouldn't leave my mind. It had a real impression and a real effect on me in regards to staying focused and motivated. And what her goal was, was actually to make the Boston Marathon. And so she was somebody that wasn't very active per se at back at that time, but she had a vision, she had a goal, she had this dream. And for her to let me know that was just one of the greatest feelings of the results that people get from using what I teach or what I share with people, which is, uh, which is awesome. And and that's a perfect segue, uh, to your transform process. So Mm -hmm. trance T R A N C E hyphen form process, not transform, but transform. Um, and this is essentially what you're talking about. Cause I know when we were talking, um, afterwards, like I like to do, I, I like to get to, to know as much as I can about our, our speakers and keynotes. And so I was on your, your website and I found, uh, this form and I filled it out and it, it gave me some videos yeah. and I've been trying to keep, keep up on them. I'm, I'm, I'm failing. I'm, I got, you got to fail to succeed. I haven't been doing it every single day. So I'm, I'm already like, but that I just, I can get better. Um, I promise I'm going to try to, to, to do that by the time we, we see each other, uh, in June. Um, but the, the whole thing is that you, so you, you put yourself in a trance in, in the standpoint of you mentioned that color, you associate a color with the success that you're striving for. Yes. And then every time that color comes up into your mind, because it's associated to that goal, it automatically switches your brain to start focusing on it. it, it that is exactly it. See, we are, we are inundated in trances throughout the whole day. And what a trance is, it's a fancy word for something that is a mental habit. It's basically anything that we do easily, effortlessly, and we don't have to think about is a trance. It really is this trance where if we're driving a car and I know my daughter's going to start driving here and she's going to be like really fearful because she has to think about all these things. She's not in that habitual trance yet. 
yeah, we know if we've driven a car for 20 years, we really don't have to think about it. We could be doing multiple things at the same time and still driving that car. So we have this process of creating habits and that's stored in the subconscious. So 80 to 90% of our behavior really is habitual subconscious. It's trances that we live in. The challenge is that a lot of people are living in negative trances that don't serve them. So they're getting those results. The great thing is that you're one thought away to get a better result through repetition, through getting people to release the resistance in their own mind, they can form new triggers, new color associations per se, to when they think of, you know, a color, a word, it immediately gets that feeling of excitement, of exhilaration. And there's a picture in their mind that is such a fast picture where it's not even conscious. A lot of times it's just in a snap that it gets them to then start to move forward in a good way. And they're like, I'm feeling so good. I don't even know why. <laughs> mm -hmm. The opposite is usually true. People feel bad for no good reason. Yeah. So I say, why not feel good for no good reason? Perform better. Inspire others to do the same. Put yourself out there and it does better for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. The whole adjective, it takes more muscles to frown than to mm -hmm. smile. So, you know, let's, let's do the positive, easy, quote unquote thing. Although it, it, it doesn't seem as easy, but um, using tools like this, it, yeah. it's all about reprogramming. Yeah. So we, we talked about um, the, the impact this has on our personal lives. Um, what about the impact uh, this has on our professional lives? Can we can utilize the trance form? for professional as well how, how does that how would that work for sure because first of all just keep in mind i want to create this perspective is that everybody's an individual so they're a person personal they take themselves to work and it becomes professional entity who you are at work is basically a reflection of your personal uh, mindset your performance so you take it with you and then you can obviously apply it to the goals and the visions and the objectives of that organization of that culture so it is the foundation of creating great leadership or better leadership it is a foundation of creating a great attitude at work it is foundation of hitting those targets those those results because the circumstances are just a result of what's going on inside. So just think of an organization that has a lot of individuals that are clashing, that um, are maybe in a, in a focus of negativity. They bring all of that to that organization, to that professional environment, and it creates a lot more. Just think the opposite. When everybody takes care of themselves, they take responsibility, they have this powerful, positive mindset, and they show up at work and in that professional environment, it's like wildfire. It just spreads in a great way. That's great. So uh, I mentioned, so you're going to be uh, providing uh, the keynote uh, on June 3rd um, there in Indianapolis. Uh, and being a hypnotist, we can expect some hypnosis going on on stage. Oh. And you're probably going to be looking for some volunteers. So that will be, so all you out there in the nation, if you're registering for STN Expo Indy, you'll have some fun um, with Wayne. He's going to have some fun with you. I think the audience will have some fun with you. Um, but it certainly will be that trance formational experience. Yes. Uh, but then a couple days earlier, as I mentioned, uh, you're going to be with their transportation director summit. Um, and that's more of an all day kind of, you know, um, training or, or more of an immersive experience. Yeah. What can those uh, participants expect to, to see when they work with you? Well, we go deeper for sure. Like the keynote, it's going to be, you know, three actionable insights they take away. I do some reverse engineering on the hypnosis. So not only do they have fun and isn't exciting, but they get to take away some tangibles that they can use in their everyday life and realize, hmm, there were some insights here that I really can apply. When we do go the, the, with all the leaders, um, it's just going to be a deeper dive. We're going to talk about languaging, how to take out words out of your vocabulary, how to get yourself in a powerful emotional state and keep that state, um, how to activate your desires. Uh, there, I just, I'm so passionate about it. And then also really focus upon how to go from fear to confidence and how to do that in many ways. So people can do it and create the habits of success as well as start to live in a different trance, not just by seeing it, but by doing it day after day. And one of the things that really uh, drives, no pun intended or pun intended, uh, this industry is that passion for safety. Yeah. And they live it every day. And you can, it's almost like you, you when you talk to a lot of these professionals, they're in a trance yeah. for safety. So I think that there are definitely going to be some synergies there. 
Um, it's not going to be a, a, a huge leap. I know many of you out there have have participated in, in, in some of these hypnotist shows. Um, so we're really looking forward to having Wayne out there in Indiana uh, with us uh, to really, you know, bring this all um, full circle so that, uh, you know, it's all about providing the tools that folks need to help with their personal and their professional lives. For sure. So really look at, so you can learn more about Wayne. You've got a website. What is it? So it's waynelee.com. And uh, that'll also give you access to some videos, a little bit more uh, about uh, some of the tools that you can use to help yourself and also the different platforms that you can check out in the videos uh, of myself as well as all the, all the people at the events. Uh, one of the things that I want to say, and, and anybody's listening, there might be some hesitation, some fear about volunteering. And my comment on that is that the same thing that's stopping you right now from maybe going up on stage will be the same thing that stops you in life. It is the fear of putting yourself out there, embarrassment, whatever. Once you get over that, you play a bigger game. So here's two enticements for people that are listening that are like on the fence or like, no, I'm not going to get hypnotized. One hour of hypnosis feels like eight to 10 hours of sleep. You feel so good, so refreshed. And two, at the end of the show, at the end of the keynote, I'm going to give people a suggestion to help them achieve that goal, just like the lady that uh, ran the Boston Marathon. So whatever your goal is, whatever your dream is, take it to the keynote and uh, be ready to achieve it. Awesome. We'll get ready for some transformation with Wayne Lee in Indianapolis in June. Um, and you can read more about Wayne as well. If you, we have an article that I mentioned earlier on stnonline.com. You can learn more uh, about Wayne there. There's a link to his website uh, and just a little bit more about what he's going to be talking about uh, in Indianapolis. Wayne, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to meeting you in person. And wow, wow, it's like, you know, less than three months. So it, like you were saying, time flies. But here we are. Um, we're, we're getting ready to rock. So uh, looking forward to seeing you. And uh, good luck to you. Thank you so very much, Ryan. And I'm looking forward to transform with everybody at the event. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Wayne. You bet. A great conversation with Ryan and Wayne. Can't wait to see you at STN Expo in Indianapolis, Wayne. It is going to be a great keynote conversation. Unlocking the keys to peak performance. Guys, this is a must attend. Reminder again, stnexpo.com. We've got our early bird special, save 100 on your main conference registration. Be sure and join us. All right, before we dive into the next interview with Paul Hassenmeyer, got a message from our sponsor. After a five-year hiatus, TransFinder's annual client summit is returning with a vengeance. The three-day conference runs from April 28th to May 1st in San Antonio, Texas, and includes a visit to the Alamo, too. The event is jam-packed with interactive classes on all TransFinder's award-winning solutions like RouteFinder, StopFinder, WayFinder, and ServiceFinder. There's even a class inside a bus, but there's a hitch, guys. You have to be a TransFinder client to attend, but here's the good news. There's still time to become a TransFinder client before their user summit. Just email them at marketing at transfinder.com and put STN in the subject line and that'll help you get started. Don't miss Transfinder's annual client summit this spring in San Antonio, Texas. It will be the best one yet, no doubt about it. All right, our next guest uh, will be a familiar name to many of you out there in the nation, Paul Hassenmeyer, uh, who is now the public safety director and fire chief for Hernando County in Florida. Paul wrote a series of blogs for us, oh, about 10 years ago and was at the STN Expo Reno 2013 and 2014. Uh, Paul Hassenmeyer, you're back with us. It's, it's great to uh, reconnect with you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. Uh, certainly time flies when you're having fun and lots of different avenues, but I've continued being involved with some school bus extrication training and um, helping some different school districts with preparations in the event of an emergency. But yeah, lots going on. Been a while since we talked, but uh, good to be back talking with you. 
Absolutely. Yeah, definitely time does fly. And, you know, with so much uh, happening, you know, it, it's like the Star Wars movie, like you're hitting warp speed and the, the stars and planets are flying by you at a crazy pace. But uh, you reached out the beginning of the year because you have a, a new book out, uh, School Bus Extrication, aptly named. I believe that came out last year. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So over the last, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so, I've, I've wrote quite a few different articles for not only um, STN, but uh, some fire service related magazines about different aspects of school bus extrication and rescue and evacuations and fire safety and so forth. So I published, I don't know, somewhere around 13, 15 different articles and Still been teaching regularly on on this topic and and many others around the country, but also I wanted to there there wasn't really a, a a small short little book for school bus extrication specifics out on the market and kind of as a capstone of a lot of stuff that I've done. I was like, I'm gonna put a bunch of pictures and words on paper and uh, yeah, publish a book. So it's uh. Not a super long book. It's um, got a lot of pictures and short words and easy reading for the fire service and even some folks in the school transportation industry to read and and to see what goes into uh, if there is a crash and how to deal with different things to take care of the kids. But I published it uh, beginning of this year. Well, January 25th is the official published date, but it's on Amazon. It's out there and I hope it uh, helps some people be more prepared for school bus crashes and emergencies in general. Absolutely, and uh, you know, and you were mentioning your your work with the the fire magazines, and I believe that 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 was where uh, we first uh, uh, got in contact. Was you were you were doing uh, some articles in some fire publications and uh, reached out and, and started talking about school buses. Um, so it, it's great to have you uh, back. You know, you're going to be in Reno in July. Uh, you know, we are um, uh, developing a, a special closing session, um, which will basically be about a three or four hour block. Um, we're going to cut it up a little bit, but um, where you're going to be talking about extrication, uh, talking about a couple of different things, uh, responding to crashes from the fire department's perspective and some things that transportation departments need to be uh, considering. Yeah, that, that's a big thing. When I've worked with school districts, um, really working with them, so school bus drivers and supervisors involved with transportation kind of understand, okay, if there is an emergency, how are we going to deal with it? And, you know, everybody has standard operating procedures and so forth, but really kind of seeing, you know, and, and fortunately, a lot of people don't see the crashes, uh, but it can happen anywhere big city USA or small town America. And I think the, the big message is preparing people for what if it does happen and how, how, how the school district can work with the fire department and what's the fire department going to be doing to provide emergency medical care or a fire threat or if, if somebody's entrapped in the bus or if it rolled over. So lots of different things to look at and think about. And then, um, Kind of expanding on on some of that with uh, you know how the school district can help help the fire rescue and law enforcement and uh, really it's uh, I try to push everybody towards being on one team and preparing ahead of time and that makes uh, those those emergencies run smoother and um, you know obviously we try to prevent them but but when they do happen. Uh, we got to be on our toes and ready to go and, and work together together to mitigate whatever's going on. Absolutely. And and one of the, the big things that's changed since uh, we last worked together uh, was that there weren't uh, there weren't any electric school buses out there. That has been um, one of the big game changers in this industry. Florida in itself, they there you guys are starting to get uh, electric school buses. I know that they're 
are quite a few now, Miami-Dade, Broward County. Um, I don't know about uh, in your area because Hernando County, you're uh, north of Tampa, yeah. if, I, if I remember correctly. I believe that there's some coming to that Hillsboro area, which is not too far from you. Uh, but in terms of electric, uh, you know, a lot of folks in the school bus industry are um, very, uh, let's say, anxious about uh, the, the coming of those. And and granted, there's only about 5,000 or so nationwide, so it's a drop in the bucket. But, you know, it's going to be uh, e- accelerating and increasing very quickly here. Um, in terms of responding to a, a fire that's an electric school bus, I mean, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, so as far as the local area here, I, I just talked to the transportation director a week or two ago and uh, so far, they're still buying diesel buses locally here. Uh, yeah, a couple different areas in the state and, and around the country are um, looking at the, the electric option. And yeah, they have since we last talked. I think when I was in Reno in 2014, there was a there was an electric bus there, and that you know it really started growing around that time, or more and more talk about it but yeah we're the fire service in general is, is similar uh to school transportation with the buses because they're looking at uh fire trucks electric fire trucks and there's certainly some issues and challenges there with how long it takes to charge recharge you know i, I look at florida as we have to do some due diligence too because you know, the power grid goes down, what's going to happen or a hurricane or a long, long-term long event uh, and and recharging those buses. But uh, that's a whole bunch of logistics on, on the fire service side, school transportation side to figure out. But also, as far as the fire threat, I can certainly tell you that over the last couple of years and the last decade, I have been to a lot more fires with uh, electric scooters, you know, everything the kids use, the electric battery powered scooters and, and even some tools uh, and electric bikes, uh, certainly electric cars. And, and then I think as there's more buses, you know, we'll see that potential, but uh, electric vehicle and the, and the battery fires are uh, tough to put out. And there's there's a lot of different methods to to extinguish, but uh, certainly uh, a little bit tougher challenge than than the traditional diesel type engines and and those tanks where we can put those those type of fires out quicker. But you know we're figuring it out, and new technology will come out to to deal with it. But I think uh, in the end, the biggest the biggest thing, especially for uh, school districts and the transportation departments is that that front end training with with school bus evacuations. If if the engine's on fire or something's on fire, having uh, the kids well trained ahead of time to evacuate efficiently off the bus and just get off and get away, and then fire department will come deal with it. Absolutely, yeah. I want to I want to come back to that, um, but we did uh, write a pretty extensive article on electric uh, bus safety and in, in terms of fires, thermal events, um, as a lot of folks like to call them. Yeah, yeah a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of summers ago, and it was really interesting. Uh, I was working with the the reporter on that one and researching and learning about the differences with a lot of the lithium batteries, mm-hmm. um, and that's evolving. And there's different types of lithium and whatnot. But just understanding that you know you can't just pour water on them like you can with most other fires. Um, and and there, I mean, is there a special type of material or are you looking at foam? I, I've heard some, in some instances, you're just trying to contain and make sure other things don't catch fire. Yeah. So lots of different things, you know, obviously depending on if it's, if the firefighters arriving on scene too, they have to identify that it's an electric related fire instead of a diesel fire, depending on the bus, but they're probably most likely start with water. I might, might use foam but e- even with the lithium ion batteries, the foam isn't totally dealing with it. There's certainly some some different techniques and technology out there with different blankets to take the oxygen away. But um, the thermal runaway is um, certainly a challenge. And, 
you know, there, there's been stories in the fire service too, where a vehicle fire happened, lithium ion vehicle fire, and then the, thought the fire was out, the car gets towed down the road and goes to the impound lot and, and relights. Uh, or I've seen a couple couple uh, of the electric vehicles in water and burning still. So uh, certainly a challenge that the fire service is figuring out uh, day to day on how to best deal with the issues. That's crazy. Burning underwater. That's, that's amazing. Um, you, you mentioned something that I wanted to, to, to follow up on, uh, I being able to, for the firefighters to identify that it's an electric school bus from a diesel school bus to a, from a gasoline school bus or propane. Um, there, there are, uh, as you might, as you probably remember 50 different States, 50 different essentially yep. regulations for how their school buses need to look aside from being yellow. They have different color rub rails and whatnot. Some states allow an alternative fuel or electric school bus to have a, a green logo or blue or how important is it to make sure that states are really um, working with fire departments across their, their states to make sure that everyone knows um, what the other side's doing. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, improving communication and so forth. And a lot of this stuff is in state law and state rule and uh, how, you know, a school bus is supposed to, to look. And, you know, the typical yellow bus with the, the black rub rails and so forth. But I think I remember 10 years ago, there was a, uh, I don't know if it was a city or county in California, they they were looking to make the rub rails green for the electric buses, and that mm-hmm. was kind of a controversy because it was in opposition to some of that legislation. But it, as far as from the first responder perspective, if we could pretty easily and fairly quickly, um, if that was a 50-state type of law where if it's an electric school bus, let's put green rub rails on it, to identify the electric, you know, those type of things would help emergency response, Mm -hmm. just being able to have that quick identification. But either that or some, a a sticker or something that's easily identifiable, you know, because you see it on passenger vehicles too, with a little logo that's tough to read. And if it's at two in the morning, you may or may not catch it. So, uh, yeah, something something would be good to identify the electric vehicles for sure. Yeah, yeah. And uh I know that you want to talk about in Reno also uh the you know, talking about collaboration, the school districts working with their local emergency first responders. Uh obviously, you know, there have been a lot, uh, especially over the last decade, a lot of school districts that are doing these mass casualty, you know, mock fatality exercises. Mm-hmm. We've done them um, in in STN Expo Reno, uh, and, and certainly, like I said, a lot have been done um, at at state and other national association uh, conferences as well. Um, but you're going to talk about the importance of school districts working with uh, their fire department. So there is that cross training and that collaboration so that all the sides know and have that relationship going. So when something does happen, that it can be as seamless as possible, the response. Yeah. So I've, since I've been, you know, years ago when I got asked, I was a much younger firefighter and asked to teach a school bus uh, extrication class. Somebody got a, a school bus and said, hey, can you teach others how to cut it up? And I, I didn't have a whole lot of experience at the time, but we uh, figured it out and, and trained, and I made some phone calls, and a couple of people did. But um, getting that training for the firefighters is, is important, and then also getting the school district involved. And, and some of the bigger combined events I've done is put – you know, a couple hundred firefighters and school transportation folks, bus drivers, supervisors in the same room for for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and, and talk about the different variables so they can be on the same page and kind of know the different roles of each. But having those conversations before a crash is important. And it's it's worth the effort because we're trying to coordinate, you know, when kids are in harm's way and, and there's a crash, but 
Also, just I encourage firefighters all the time to stop at the local school district transportation bus yard and stop in and and look at the bus. Just look at the bus as is, not even having to cut on it. They're not going to let you cut up a new one. Yeah. But I was just at the local yard here a week or two ago and and uh, checking out some of the the newer stuff they have on the brand new buses as far as the the lifts and the the wheelchair systems to to stabilize the wheelchairs in there and looking at uh, the different types of seat belts that are coming out and uh, so looking at those safety features so if firefighters have to deal with it they they have a little bit of that front end and knowledge and then who better than the bus drivers to to tell them you know this is how this works or um because you know a lot of a lot of the firefighters too, they're amazed that the, the lifts for for the handicapped wheelchairs and, and so forth, you know, they're electric powered off off the battery uh, of the engine. But if there's no power to the bus, you can also use, you, it's like a, using a bottle jack. Yeah. And firefighters understand a bottle jack. Um, so you have different options, but giving them that knowledge to work together, super important. Um, I think it, it creates great collaboration between the local bus drivers and school transportation folks, EMS, law enforcement, firefighters to, to, and then, then they know faces too. If something happens, they, they see somebody they've seen before and, uh, you know, they're going to work even better together. Relationships are always important. And uh, being uh, someone who uh, in my single days who uh, had uh, several housemates who were firefighters, I understand how much you guys train and how you love to train. And that's that's something very similar that you have with school transportation. Mm -hmm. The school transportation folks are always training. So I know that uh, firefighters are always looking for that opportunity to learn more and get their hands on. Um, so they can they can really play with this stuff so they can figure out what to do um, when something happens. Closing thoughts. I know you, you mentioned seat belts. I know before we were talking uh, before this podcast, you're very passionate about seat belts. It's a, it's a topic uh, that is top of mind for you. I know we were talking about uh, the recent uh, Ohio school bus working group that was called and previously to from being in uh, Florida, I believe you were you were in Ohio. So. You know, want to want to get your thoughts on on seat belts uh, in school buses? Yeah, so I in the the book I just had published, I talk a, briefly about seat belts in the opening. But um, you know, there's there's laws requiring seat belts for all of us. When I think in pretty much every state, driving down the road in our personal vehicles or a semi or a fire truck or anything, and and um, I'm, I'm passionate about the need for seatbelts on school buses. I think it's important uh, for a variety of reasons. And I know because I've cut up a lot of school buses in training and they are built tough. They're built like tanks. Uh, they really are. And they protect the kids and the high back seats and so forth. And sometimes folks will say, well, the kids can evacuate quicker in a, in, if there's a fire without seatbelts. And um from speaking from experience and I'm a father and married father and have uh, three daughters and my young kids uh, a few years ago, they could get out of their car seats after a little bit of practice. So I know these kids riding on school buses can unbuckle from a seatbelt very quickly and exit. Um, but my biggest fear is, and I've been on several of them in the rollover type collision when a school bus goes off the edge of the road or gets T-boned and rolled, that the kids on the bus, unrestrained, will fly and potentially, you know, they're they're getting thrown all over the bus, and that can create serious injuries. And that's my biggest fear. I, I I'm a big proponent of of moving forward with seatbelts on school buses for for that reason alone. Um, the evacuation thing with, with a little bit of training, understanding uh, how to evacuate the bus, that, that's not a concern to me. But um, when, when school buses rolls, when anything rolls and, and all the crashes I've been on, whether it's a small vehicle or a big vehicle, if, if you're unrestrained, you could potentially get ejected or seriously hurt or killed. And I'd like to see us work in the, in the school 
transportation industry to restrain the kids so that doesn't happen. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Really looking forward to having you uh, back in, in Reno this summer. We'll catch up. Um, and, you know, it's going to be great, um, folks, as you uh, look at the agenda uh, for July. We're going to kind of bookend um, the the expo experience talking about uh, crashes and accidents. On Friday, we have uh, Dick Fisher, who's going to be uh, talking about looking at the school bus accident investigation from a standpoint of, of preparing for litigation. And we're going to be uh, completing things at the end with Paul. He's going to be doing a deep dive on the actual school bus crash um, or incident um, and fire's response uh, to that. So, again, really looking forward to the conversation, Paul. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. See you this summer. And thank you again for your great service uh, to Hernando County and the nationwide, all you guys, all you firefighters out there. Couldn't do it without you. Thanks. Appreciate it. A special thanks to Ryan, Wayne, and Paul for joining this episode of the STN Podcast. We appreciate you guys. We also appreciate our sponsors, TransFinder, First Student, and the Propane Education Research Council, also known as PERC. And uh, we're excited to have all of them come together to be part of this great podcast. Guys, you can check out everything in the school transportation industry, news, analysis, everything affecting you and your business and operation, stnonline.com. Check out those analysis and latest updates. Also, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you listen to pods for all the great conversation that happens here on School Transportation Nation. Guys, we love you. We'll see you next week.